probably most of you know, the past few decades has seen um, Tibetan Buddhism make deeper missionary inroads in the Sinophone world than really ever before. Um, not only have Tibetan Buddhist teachers garnered significant and dedicated followings here in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, and in Southeast Asia, but the past few decades have also seen uh, Tibetan Buddhism establish popular roots among the mainland um, Han Chinese urban middle class. Um, I first set out about re researching Han Chinese involvement in Tibetan Buddhism about a decade ago um, as a doctoral student in anthropology. And among other things, I was interested in understanding the evolution and diversification of um, participatory infrastructures for Chinese practitioners in the reconstituted, the, um, the reconstituted landscape of uh, Tibetan Buddhism um, in the PRC. Um, if you just take a little look at this map, it sort of um, situates Tibetan areas uh, in China, and you can see uh, Sichuan province there on the right. And my field work based for the better part of two years of field work was in, in Chengdu in Sichuan. And the, this was due to Chengdu's strategic location as a hub between the Tibetan regions of Western Sichuan and the rest of China. Um, from um, you know, previous years living there, I um, knew it to be home not only to one of the largest urban Tibetan diasporas in mainland China, but also to be an important ground for contemporary Sino-Tibetan religious interactions. The remarkable number and the overall, um, I guess you could say, prominence of Tibetan lamas uh, in contemporary Chengdu hinged largely on its status as the main metropolitan and transport hub of Southwest China. And because of this, Tibetan lamas from uh, most of Sichuan's Tibetan regions um, and other places too, inevitably passed through the city en route to destinations elsewhere in, in inland China. Um, many lamas had also established residences in the city uh, where they stayed in particular during the winter months. And in light of this um, fortuitous endowment, many uh, Chinese fieldwork friends at the time assured me that the, uh, it was an ideal vantage point from which to approach the action. And I can remember um, one uh, fieldwork friend actually from Guangzhou telling me very early in my fieldwork, she just, we were speaking on the phone and she said to me, just bide your time. Um, soon enough, you'll be meeting all the living Buddhas and venerable masters you can think of. Um, and uh, so this is just a sort of a, a close up of Sichuan province and you can uh, see just the errors David mentioned before the um, Aba or Lawa um, Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture in the north of Sichuan province and the Ganzi or Garzi Tibetan uh, Autonomous Prefecture there in the west. So yeah, it, it really was indeed not long before I found myself uh, in Chengdu inundated with invitations from Chinese lay friends to meet and venerate Tibetan lamas, um, attend collective activities like um, life liberation rituals, share meals at vegetarian restaurants, chat at tea houses, and um, take part in Dharma study groups. In Chengdu, the lay Sinophone Tibetan Buddhist milieu was lively and it was social and it uh, presented many interfaces across which to network. Come the summer months though, and the center of action shifted to Eastern Tibetan regions as multitudes of Han Chinese lay Buddhists undertook religious pilgrimages to the monasteries of their lamas. The core focus of these visits was attendance at large scale multi day ritual events known as Dharma assemblies. Um, during my field work, alongside, alongside uh, Chinese, uh, various uh, Chinese uh, followers and field work friends, I uh, calculated that I attended eight different Dharma assemblies at uh, Tibetan monasteries in um, 
the Gansu Autonomous Prefecture. Now, one or two of these were mass events with um, many thousands of attendees, but most were significantly smaller, um, usually um, numbering perhaps one to 200 participants or, or sometimes um, perhaps only 60 or 70 Chinese uh, attendees, but of course more um, Tibetans uh, from the locality in which the Dharma assemblies were being held. Um, so notwithstanding uh, the many uh, features that uh, these events shared in common, uh, no one Dharma assembly experience was identical. Uh, each event varied not only in scale, but also in terms of its liturgical focus, the number of days it ran for, and other key organizational details. Um, so what I refer to as a Dharma assembly is a direct translation uh, of the Chinese term fa hui or the uh, Tibetan term chu tsok. Now, alternative uh, translations of these terms include uh, a Dharma gathering, a Dharma event, uh, or a Dharma festival. And as these English translations imply, the term Dharma assembly is a capacious category of ritual event. Um, it probably initially referred to a gathering to preach the Buddhist teachings and recite the scriptures, but over the centuries, Dharma assemblies in both the Chinese and Tibetan Buddhist traditions have come to integrate um, numerous other elements, um, including um, chanting, prayers, vows, meditations, visualizations, um, dances, uh, offerings, alms giving, and, and more. And in the Tibetan uh, Vajrayana tradition, tantric empowerment ceremonies are often a key component of Dharma assemblies. And in the context of my field work, the two were uh, practically synonymous. Um, Dharma, so Dharma assemblies of various kinds have been popular across the ages for mediating lay monastic or lay specialist interactions in the Tibetan and Chinese Buddhist contexts. And they've also played a historical role in mediating Sino-Tibetan religious interactions. Uh, one needn't look any further than to the early, early 20th century in China's uh, tumultuous Republican era, when a number of high-profile high Tibetan lamas in Chinese cities presided over over mass Dharma assemblies to avert disaster and eradicate trouble. So Tibetan Dharma assemblies quite clearly are not new, but what is new in the context of the Sino-Tibetan Buddhist revival in mainland China are the historical and infrastructural conditions that have enabled Dharma assemblies at Tibetan monasteries to become fixtures of Han Chinese involvement in Tibetan Buddhism. So in my talk today, I'd like to discuss the outsized role the Dharma Assembly has played in facilitating, focusing, and fostering Han Chinese participation in Tibetan monastic contexts. I'd um, like to explore how in recent decades, Dharma assemblies have been creatively and flexibly deployed to meet and mediate the needs of Tibetan lamas, their monasteries, and Chinese followers during a burgeoning period of cross-cultural religious encounter. So uh, my talk uh, is, is divided into two parts. In the first part, I um, want to situate the emergence of, Dharma, of, 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 or of the Dharma assembly as a fixture of Han Chinese involvement in Tibetan Buddhism against the backdrop of four interrelated infrastructural backdrops. And in the second part, I um, want to explore the elements of a quintessential Dharma assembly experience and in so doing, shed light on uh, new forms of organizational innovation and religious sociality that have developed around traditional templates of religious interaction within recent conditions of Sino-Tibetan interconnectivity. So these are the four intercepting infrastructures um, that I um, uh, would like to discuss. Transport infrastructure, regulatory infrastructure, monastery infrastructure, and uh, participatory infrastructure. So in terms of 
transport infrastructure, the revitalized landscape of Sino-Tibetan interactions in the 21st century is shaped and animated by unprecedented mobility on the part of Tibetan religious teachers and Chinese disciples alike. The last uh, three decades have seen uh, individual Tibetan lamas travel back and forth to inland China uh, for missionary and fundraising purposes in record numbers. Um, the same period has witnessed seasonal travel to Tibetan areas become a constitutive religious practice for many urban based followers from all corners of mainland China and beyond. For the first time ever, safe Tibetan sacred landscapes, monastery spaces, and ritual gatherings have emerged as popular settings for Han Chinese involvement in Tibetan Buddhism. Now, if we uh, compare this to the first half of the 20th century, this was a time when all but a very small number of um, intrepid and highly dedicated Han Chinese practitioners of Tibetan Buddhism undertook or were able to undertake the long and difficult journey uh, to the Tibetan plateau. And those who did make it uh, to monasteries in Kham and central Tibet described describe themselves as uh, going abroad uh, to study uh, Liu Xue. And um, by necessity, because of the journey, they stayed for long periods of time. Now, this idea of going abroad to study obviously reflects a different national imaginary, an era before the um, territorial consolidation of Tibetan areas within the PRC, but it also conveys a sense of great physical distance and ecological separation. In the contemporary era, however, massively improved transport infrastructures and motoring technologies have facilitated a totally unprecedented ease of circulation between Tibetan areas and, um, and inland China. Um, so I'm just going to play you um, a short video. <laughs> So that movie, that, that, or that short video that I just showed with the highly um, uh, dramatic uh, soundtrack is a very recent one. It's from, uh, I think, December 2018. Um, and what it shows is the Xinkang Bridge on the Yakang Expressway, which is part of the um, upgraded Sichuan Tibet Expressway, which is um, still in progress. Um, so this is really an absolutely unprecedented uh, uh, um, example of uh, uh, road uh, infrastructure and, uh, uh, and, and road engineering. Um, it um, is essentially linking Tibetan areas, particularly Eastern Tibetan areas uh, with inland China in a way that has um, literally, uh, you know, it, it's absolutely unprecedented and uh, journeys that previously uh, might have taken, um, you know, the, a day are now being, uh, you know, reduced to an hour or two. Um, there is an immense amount of uh, money being invested in this project. I believe that the uh, entire project uh, is, uh, has, is, is worth something like 500 billion yuan, um, and this bridge alone costs cost 23 billion yuan to um, construct. And it was only opened um, in um, December of 2018. So in some ways, this really um, speaks to what the future um, of is going to be um, for interactions, cultural interactions, religious interactions, economic interactions, et cetera, between um, uh, inland Chinese areas and, um, and, and Tibetan regions. Um, for the 
better part of the last three decades, most of uh, Sino-Tibetan religious interactions, at least in Sichuan, have not played out in this kind of road landscape. I think it is accurate to say that they've played out against a backdrop of continuously improving but still quite difficult road conditions. Um, Poor surfaces, hairpin bends, traffic jams, landslides, accidents, breakdowns are all have all been relatively uh, relatively par for the course. Nevertheless, um, car travel has been readily possible, and indeed, if one uh, compares the situation to the um, first part of the twentieth uh, century, then it's it's really uh, worlds apart. And so, for this reason, um, these these um, these improved transport conditions have very much um, shaped the um, contemporary Sino-Tibetan religious encounter. Um, I should point out, though, that um, self-identifying followers of Tibetan Buddhism, they're far from the only people from mainland China um, undertaking or, you know, taking advantage of these modern road conditions to undertake travels in the Sino-Tibetan borderlands. Um, since the 1990s and throughout the 2000s, um, these regions have become uh, increasingly attractive destinations for Chinese independent travelers. Um, this is a period uh, in which wholly revised tropes of Tibetan landscape, culture, and people have entered into the popular Chinese social imaginary through tourism advertisements, travel guides, television, and popular culture. Um, tourist operators and local governments um, have uh, been appropriating explicitly um, the uh, West's orientalist myth of Shangri-La in their promotion of Tibetan landscapes and life worlds as romanticized, spiritualized travel de destinations distinct from everyday life. Um, visual representat representations infuse the Tibetan landscape with redemptive qualities of purity, awe, and spiritual power. So one might say that within this context, all travel to these regions is potentially generative of spiritual meanings. Um, during my um, fieldwork, of course, Chinese followers of Tibetan Buddhism um, were very, um, you know, very actively distinguished their pilgrimage practices in Tibetan areas from those of their travel or tourist compatriots um, by drawing attention largely to um, their inner attitudes and dispositions rooted in a committed Buddhist worldview. Um, but it was also clear, um, you know, from, from my perspective, from a, from a spatial perspective, that their travels revolved much more closely around institutional Buddhist spaces and events, especially Dharma assemblies. Um, and in the context of the Dharma assembly, um, it's particularly important the fact that um, Chinese followers, unlike tourists, travel to a monastery as the faithful disciples of a given lama, um, often a reincarnate lama or a senior, um, a senior monastic, and that they are hosted on site as his, you know, they're almost exclusively um, male teachers, as his personal guests for the duration of their stay. So at the time of my field research, this ease of travel had made monasteries in Eastern Tibetan regions accessible from within mm, one to uh, two days of travel from Chengdu and had thereby enabled large groups of followers from all corners of China to um, basically embark on expeditions uh, to attend Dharma assemblies at the same time. The summer months or motorcades of SUVs packed with, um, with, with Chinese Buddhists setting out from Chengdu for their teachers' monasteries in Eastern Tibetan regions. Um, the popularization of religious pilgrimage and participation in, in Dharma assemblies, so uh, Chao Sheng and uh, Tan Jia Fa Hui as two popular ways of engaging in Tibetan Buddhism, this, this had really seen the summer months um, become a kind of sacred season, um, a time of, uh, of gathering, of ritual and of collective effervescence, a time when the Sino-Tibetan borderlands came alive as a powerful space to escape the drabness and materialism of everyday life in, or, in order to enact collective journeys of spiritual self-discovery, purification, and transformation. 
And these are some pictures of um, motorcades of uh, Chinese followers making their way um, along roads in Eastern Tibet on the way to their teachers' monasteries. Um, and you can see that uh, in all of these cases, um, it's generally the case that Tibetan drivers are hired along with their vehicles and the vehicles are each given a, a number and the cars stay together for the duration of the trip. Though in some cases there were, um, there were um, a few uh, Chinese followers who did have their own SUVs and they drove them themselves. But generally speaking, these vehicles are dro driven by Tibetan um, Tibetan drivers. And I just wanted to draw your attention to this particular, or the flag on this particular vehicle. Um, and the uh, words in Chinese and Tibetan on the flag say, the journey home. Um, and so the idea here, here is that uh, Chinese followers are embarking on a journey to their maybe true home or spiritual home. Um, and uh, uh, hence the words on that flag. Um, and that is a lineup of these vehicles once they had reached the monastery site in uh, Eastern Tibet. So um, the next uh, infrastructure in which I'd like to situate Dharma assemblies is that of monastery infrastructures. So the main real point here or, or, or um, important backdrop is the fact that Sino-Tibetan religious interactions over the throughout the past uh, three decades during the post-Mao period have taken place against the backdrop of and in step with um, the revival of Tibetan Buddhism in the wake of the Cultural Revolution, which, as um, you're all no doubt aware, left um, Tibetan monasteries absolutely destroyed. Um, now, many scholars have pointed out that um, since the uh, relaxation of religious, poli of, of, of religious policy in the 1980s, the environment in which Tibetan monasteries have sought to reconstitute themselves has been very different from the situation uh, you know, prior to the 1950s. Um, and uh, obviously the political context has changed, the uh, social context has changed, and um, also the economic context has changed as well. Um, traditional um, economic arrangements that supported um, Tibetan monasteries are um, no longer in place. And so many, um, and uh, Chinese uh, religious policy calls for monasteries to be, you know, self-sufficient. And so many monasteries um, have, um, um, over the years, um, needed to look for alternative sorts of revenue in order to um, fund their ongoing infrastructural development um, and also other projects as well. Um, generally, the way the story is told is that after the Cultural Revolution, there was a, um, um, a very strong uh, grassroots response from Tibetans who all pitched in to help rebuild the monasteries. Um, as time went on though, um, and, um, and, and further you know, um, construction was needed, um, um, in many cases, monasteries, uh, particularly in Eastern Tibetan areas, have um, turned to um, Chinese patrons for assistance with these projects. Um, this is also a period when Tibetan lamas, particularly reincarnate lamas in Eastern Tibet, have become involved in uh, local philanthropic initiatives too. Um, for example, building schools and building medical clinics. So it's against this backdrop that the um, sort of growth in Han Chinese interest in Tibetan Buddhism has, has really generated a um, potentially uh, lucrative source of um, patronage revenue for Tibetan, um, for Tibetan monasteries. Um, and so over the last few decades, um, Probably since the you know the mid 1990s, certainly throughout the 2000s, many of um, my mom would say the majority of Tibetan lamas actively networking in mainland China are ones for whom um, the commitment to monastic and social development and 
on the one hand and religious outreach in Han China uh, very much deeply um, interlocking. So um, yes, so uh, this is to say that they have um, um, that, that, that um, fundraising and generating revenue to, um, to rebuild their monasteries, to further develop them, and also to support local philanthropic initiatives has been a priority for many teachers. Um, and so this is, of course, um, very well known um, to Chinese followers of Tibetan Buddhism. In, in fact, in Chinese, this idea that was very common during my field work that Huayuan and Hongfa were the two uh, widely recognized goals of Tibetan lamas um, in China. So Huayuan meaning, you know, fundraising um, and Hongfa spreading the Dharma. So um, these were seen to be two valid um, activities that went hand in hand. Um, Chinese followers, for the most part, have been very willing and forthcoming with um, generosity in this regard. And uh, for many, well, certainly not, um, not all Chinese followers and major patrons, nevertheless, for almost everyone, um, giving um, is, is fundamental to constituting oneself as a lay Buddhist. Um, um, Chinese followers have also been really active in helping uh, their Tibetan lamas with these projects through introducing members of their social network to them. Um, and generally speaking, I um, uh, uh, um, uh, view the patronage relationship um, in this context as mutually beneficial. Um, one person said to me quite uh, in a quite a matter of fact way, Tibetan monasteries need to develop and Chinese people need a pure field of merit. So against this backdrop, Dharma assemblies have played an important role in the fundraising project. Um, a Dharma assembly uh, does function as a traditional platform or an important uh, platform for fundraising. Not only um, uh, uh, is revenue generated in the context of the immediate ritual, um, say in the form of you know, offerings to the monastery or to the Lama, I mean, various sorts of gifts that can be made, but also by enabling um, Chinese followers to um, to form a more long-term solidary relationship with the monastery in question. Um, and, I, and I think what's important here is that for many followers in, the, in inland China, their major point of uh, reference is naturally their Lama. If they're not uh, visiting the monastery often, or if they've never even visited it, then it may even be that that, that seems a rather sort of, you know, amorphous place and amorphous um, goal. However, when one actually has lived in Embodied experience of the monastery, one meets people there, one understands the situation, then quite likely one is going to feel more motivated um, and inspired to support this cause. So Dharma assemblies um, do work in this way. They enable followers to forge a bond uh, with the community in person. And indeed, throughout my field work, um, many Chinese followers were urged by their lamas at, at, while participating at Dharma assemblies to look upon these monasteries and these communities as their own spiritual homes. Um, so Dharma assemblies, you know, they, they, they also work as... Um, opportunities to show uh, Chinese followers the need for fundraising, you know, by taking them around and showing them the current state of, of, of buildings and other facilities. Um, if Chinese followers have already uh, been contributing to these projects, then it enables lamas to show them the, the state of project and that their money is being used in an accountable way. Um, and Dharma assemblies also um, work as an opportunity to thank uh, Chinese disciples and patrons um, for their support. Um, at the same time, because usually when a, you know, a Dharma assembly happens, the audiences present include uh, monastics from the monastery, um, local lay people, um, quite oftentimes um, school children from the community, um, the, clearly the, the Lama, the monastic leadership and uh, Chinese followers. So in some sense, there are very important meanings being sort of communicated and different meanings being communicated to these different audiences. 
Um, certainly, um, Dharma Assemblies also focuses uh, as, a, as, a, as a way that uh, Tibetan leaders can legitimize themselves in the eyes of the local population, especially for those who spend a long way away for them, a long time away from their monasteries throughout the year, then Dharma Assemblies um, are a chance for them to show what you know show the local communities what they're doing uh, with their um, uh, time um, to show them that they are at the end of the day accountable to uh, their communities and to sort of um, make it clear what their activities the nature of their activities in mainland China is um, so um, Yes, I just, this is um, a picture of a very large and uh, cutting edge assembly hall in, uh, in Cum that was under construction. This photo was taken in 2012 or 2013. Um, this picture was taken on a Dharma assembly visit. Uh, we were all taken to um, view the structure as it was being constructed. Um, so you can see from this picture that um, that you know some of the other buildings are in a uh, well. There's actually two buildings here under construction. Um, um, from this picture here, you can see that there are one or two buildings that are already in um, quite a you know a, a finished and uh, fine looking state. Um, and these are two pictures of the monastic community, one from the 1990s and one from uh, 2016. And you can see that in terms of the physical infrastructure of this community, that it, the difference is, is really between um, night and day. Um, and um, Chinese patronage has been um, very um, instrumental in the development of this community's uh, physical infrastructure. Um, there are, I think, perhaps five or six reincarnate lamas from this monastery who are all actively networking in inland China, and they've been responsible for uh, renovating uh, different buildings within the monastic complex. So, um, as you can see, the you know um, renovating is not just the external structure, but also the um, um, you know, the internal supports um, in this um, monastery, uh, a massive Guru Rinpoche or Padmasambhava statue was also constructed. Um, I'll just play you this little video. <laughs> Um, and as well in this monastic community, there is a primary school that the uh, lamas have, uh, uh, well, that one lama in particular has been active in building and supporting. And so during this Dharma uh, assembly visit, um, everyone was um, taken to uh, visit this school too. And you can see by the unfinished nature of the wood on the houses behind the people in the picture on the right that this um, school is still under construction. So the next infrastructure in which, in light of which I'd like to situate the Dharma Assembly is that of regulatory infrastructures. Um, and it, look, it might come as a surprise to some of you, but it also might come as um, nothing of a surprise to you that um, despite uh, what I said earlier about Tibetan Buddhism's uh, missionary inroads in mainland China uh, being deeper than ever before, uh, actually, um, at the level of re religious regulation, Tibetan lamas are prohibited from proselytizing in inland Chinese uh, re regions. So there is a regulatory prohibition against them um, spreading the Dharma in Han Chinese religions. And it's um, uh, the idea behind that is that um, religion should cleave to their respective ethnic territories. Um, in addition to that, um, there is also a um, very well-known sort of a, a tenet of uh, religious policy in China that um, religious activities um, can only take, so collective group religious activities can only take place in um, state-sanctioned uh, religious uh, venues. 
Um, now, while Tibetan lamas, uh, or certainly the majority of them, come from um, state-sanctioned religious venues, venues in Tibetan areas, they lack such bases in Han Chinese regions. So if they are traveling or missionizing in Han, Han Chinese uh, regions, this, uh, these regulations deprive their activities of a legal status. Now, in practice, this hasn't... Um, hobbled matters terribly um, from the point of view that um, um, people still find spaces in which to uh, meet and ways in which to carry out their activities. But generally speaking, it does push things to be rather to people to keep things on the small scale, um, to be discreet, to be low profile, sometimes to be a bit under the radar. Um, of course, um, um, you know things change depending on the, um, you know the the perhaps the you know the tenor at the time, um, but generally speaking, um, this this policy infrastructure or this policy terrain makes it so that um, you don't in mainland China, or it's very difficult in mainland China to imagine a situation like let's say in. I don't know, in Taiwan or in uh, in the West, where you have a large public facing, you know, Dharma organizations that um, embrace a trans regional audience. Um, so it base it does inhibit the sort of formal organizing of um, or yes, formal, formal and large scale uh, religious organization. So this is an important backdrop because it's in this context that Tibetan monastery space takes on an extra significance. Um, it is a, uh, a, legally, a legally sanctioned venue. They are allowed to hold religious activities. Yes, uh, permission is needed to hold large events and also technically to host outside guests, but there has been, uh, generally speaking, much more latitude and flexibility um, for them to carry out large um, activities in monastic spaces than, um, than, um, than clearly when they're in inland China. Um, and another important consideration here is that certainly at least since the 1990s, the uh, Eastern Tibetan, uh, the, you know, the parts of Tibet that, uh, the Tibetan areas that fall within the um, Chinese provinces of Sichuan and Qinghai and Yunnan have tended to be more relaxed in terms of religious policy than central Tibet. So these regulatory um, factors have all conspired to make a rather fertile environment for the development of Dharma assemblies as a fixture of Han Chinese involvement in Tibetan Buddhism. So, um, oh, just to and to say, so now to sort of describe, what I want to do is to describe the Dharma Assembly as a participatory infrastructure. And here, what I would like to emphasize is that um, most Tibetan monasteries don't um, have much provision for China, to, to much provisions for Chinese uh, followers to um, reside there um, or to, um, or, or to dwell there meaningfully. There are language barriers, but uh, beyond that, these are monastery spaces, they're designed for monastics. And so even if Han Chinese um, Buddhists have a curiosity about um, and um, uh, feel a sense of gravitation towards these contexts, with the exception of several key institutions that have substantial um, long-term communities, and there's only very, very few of them um, in uh, contemporary China today. Most universities really, uh, sorry, most uh, monasteries are not really, um, uh, yeah, viable places for Han Chinese um, followers um, to spend any length of time at, or perhaps even any meaningful length of time at, outside um, the context of uh, Dharma assemblies. So Dharma assemblies, um, they provide a platform for Han Chinese participation in Tibetan uh, Buddhist monastic context. Relationary, they are a privileged backstage re register of travel. And uh, this entails Chinese followers being received with congeniality, hospitality, and with insider status as fellow Buddhist adherents and patrons of specific monastic moral communities. So at the same time, so on the one hand, we have this backstage register of travel and insider status. 
Um, at the same time, the Dharma Assembly uh, being a large scale and ritually embellished event gives um, Chinese uh, followers a, a, a structured um, way to engage with the community and also gives them access to um, taking part and witnessing monastic life at its ritually most uh, uh, festive and culturally authentic. So Dharma assemblies, moreover, they are very, uh, uh, very flexible occasions. They lend themselves equally to social religion, to sociological religion. They engage people of all backgrounds and religious dispositions. Um, they're a popular format, as I mentioned before, within both Tibetan Buddhism and Chinese Buddhism. They allow people to gain merit, to accrue blessings. Um, insofar as they feature empowerments, they give people the, 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 um, the qualification they need to undertake certain sorts of practice, they accommodate elite and popular tastes, and, um, and they are an entertaining and accessible means of taking part in these contexts that don't require participants necessarily to have language skills. Um, they're versi very versatile. They're able to be accommodated to all sorts of conditions. This is from an organizational point of view. They can be scaled up. They can be scaled down. They can be held in tents, in monasteries, in private residences. Um, they can um, incorporate new elements over time. Um, and they can also evolve in, 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 in line with religious trends. So um, as a participatory uh, structure, the uh, Dharma Assembly um, is one that is very uh, congenial, has been very congenial to the past few decades of uh, Sino-Tibetan um, religious re-encounter, um, particularly good for newcomers. And over the uh, past decade or two, you know, most people have been newcomers uh, to Tibetan Buddhism. And so in some ways, these are considered to provide entry gate, um, uh, gates of entry to the Dharma. Um, at the same time, um, they are also considered to be platforms of spreading the Dharma. People can bring with them family members, friends, non-Buddhists, who are all able to sort of take part in what is a um, beneficial uh, event, regardless of what one's personal convictions uh, might be. Um, so in terms of the Dharma Assembly experience, um, during my field work, um, I, 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 the Dharma Assembly was already a rather mature religious infrastructure. Um, it had played a role in mediating Sino-Tibetan religious interactions um, from, you know, at least the 1990s. And as more Tibetan lamas established networks of Chinese disciples, um, the, the presence of these disciples at Dharma assemblies uh, became increasingly in common. Um, and so um, Tibetan lamas would, um, and, and Chinese uh, uh, disciples together, would um, explicitly time their visits to uh, monasteries to uh, uh, coincide with large scale uh, ritual events. That's sort of how things first developed. And indeed, this was still a common practice throughout my fieldwork period, too. However, at the same time, so as essentially Dharma assemblies became increasingly popular among Chinese audiences, and obviously remunerative for lamas and their monasteries, there was an increasing shift at the same time to arrange Dharma assemblies, um, especially for Chinese audiences. So scheduling them at a convenient time of the year or, um, a, or generally that, but uh, essentially holding an event that would not have otherwise necessarily taken place in the monastic ritual context. Um, so there was sort of a spectrum of, of arrangements in, in, uh, in this regard. So um, I guess at the one end of the spectrum, you have um, Larunga, the uh, Larong Five Sciences uh, Buddhist um, Academy, which from the 1990s instituted its uh, Vajrasattva Prayer Festival or Dharma Assembly as part of its permanent ritual in, uh, 
calendar. And this uh, Dharma Assembly was oriented, especially oriented uh, to Han Chinese uh, followers and indeed the Han Chinese population at La Ronga, community at La Ronga was in charge of coordinating it. So this is quite a remarkable example of a Dharma Assembly being enshrined in the permanent ritual calendar of an institution. What was uh, more the case, more often the case when Dharma assemblies were being um, um, scheduled, um, especially for Han Chinese audiences, it was sort of generally more ad hoc. The situation um, uh, sort of would, would potentially change depending on, um, um, on, on the situation at hand. Um, and of course, there was um, an increasing situation. You know, there was it was very common, rather, that um, in in many monasteries, that um, a Chinese um, patrons might um, sponsor a uh, Dharma assembly that was part of the existing ritual calendar. And so, sort of a, a variety of uh, configurations existed. Um, in any case, um, uh, as Ministering to Chinese disciples became an increasingly important uh, part of many Tibetan farmers and also vital to the um, monastery economies. Hosting um, Dharma assembly or creating Dharma assembly, uh, engaging Dharma assembly itineraries became um, um, increasingly important. Um, and the creation of the contemporary Dharma assembly experience or the contemporary Dharma assembly itinerary is um, a, a collaborative enterprise, a collaborative enterprise between Tibetan lamas, uh, between um, their, their, their households, their retinues, their monasteries, and also Chinese followers. Um, Chinese followers they also drew on their own experience of um, of, of Dharma assemblies and brought and uh, and and you know so in a way the Dharma assembly experience as accommodating and catering to Tibetan uh, to Chinese uh, followers um, became more emphasized than the Dharma assembly experience um, uh, started to um, uh, yeah, diversify and take form, take, take a kind of a recognizable form, I think that we could say. Um, having said that though, um, describe the Dharma Assembly as a modular configuration into constitutive parts. And that's what I'm just going to do in, in, in my time uh, remaining um, is tell you, and this is all sort of gleaned or distilled from my own um, attendance at various Dharma assemblies. And of course, my discussions with other people who took part in other contexts. So I'd like to, uh, yes, walk you through the um, elements of the Dharma assembly experience for Han Chinese followers at uh, Tibetan monasteries. So these really are the core elements. You've got the liturgical core of the experience. That really is the, the foundation. And then in addition to that, there are other ritual activities, perhaps teachings, cultural performances, giving and, and philanthropy, sightseeing and relationality. So in terms of the liturgical call, um, this really was the anchor of the entire event, it, uh, the formal purpose of the visit, and usually featured at the beginning of the Dharma Assembly program. Um, the liturgical proceedings could uh, vary in length at La Ronga. Um, some Dharma Assemblies were nine days. In other contexts, I visited two or five days. Um, and at those Dharma festivals that were um, designed for uh, Chinese followers specifically, then really people could be very flexible about the length of the liturgical um, uh, component. So typically what would happen, it would begin with an, an empowerment, but not necessarily always. And then this would be followed with days of chanting mantra or reciting uh, liturgies. Um, in some uh, monasteries, Chinese audiences were hosted in them in monastery buildings. In others, tents were erected for the events, uh, much dependent on the facilities and the weather. 
and also the extent of lay audience participation uh, that was provided for did vary. So at some Dharma assemblies, uh, printed liturgies were provided for with Chinese transcription of the, uh, you know, the Tibetan uh, chanting, while other contexts um, actually offered nothing. And in these situations, audience would sit by while the monastics um, practiced the recitation. Um, but still the audiences, um, opportunities were arranged for the audience to participate by making offerings to the Sangha. Um, attendees could also prostrate in front of uh, where the Sangha was chanting. So uh, there was quite a bit of variety in this regard. So this first picture is from the Vajrasattva initiation at Larunga, uh, the one on the left in 2013 and the one on the right in 2014. So this is an example of a mass event uh, at top is Lama Munso uh, conferring the empowerment. Um, this, the Larunga Vajrasattva prayer assembly, in some ways serving as a prototype of Dharma assemblies in the Han Chinese milieu, nevertheless is exceptional. Um, as I mentioned before, um, because it's enshrined in the permanent ritual calendar and also simply because of its, um, of its size. So um, here at Larunga, you have a purpose, well, certainly in the last um, decade, there has been a purpose-built um, facility, um, Chinese assembly hall, um, uh, where lay followers visiting Larunga congregate during the ritual and um, engage in the, in the liturgical component of the Dharma assembly. Um, this is uh, a much, much smaller monastery with uh, 60 followers um, taking part in the Dharma assembly. Um, and uh, here you can see that the Chinese followers are being uh, accommodated in one of the, uh, in a monastic space. Um, but this is a situation where a tent has been erected on the monastery uh, property and the Dharma assembly is taking place outside. So you can see everybody there reciting from their printed liturgy booklets. This is um, a photo taken from a one Dharma assembly I attended that did not provide uh, the attendees with any way of um, taking part in the chanting themselves. So in this case, you can see uh, the attendees here on the left prostrating in front of the assembly as they um, recite the sadhana for the assembly. And that is the assembly on their lunch break. Um, generally, at the sometime during the, the, the uh, liturgical component, a uh, tok or a gana chakra offering uh, uh, was, uh, was um, performed, and this would give each pa uh, participant a large bag of ritually consecrated food items, and uh, uh, visiting attendees usually carefully set these aside for them to take home to family members and dharma friends. Now, besides the key liturgical component, um, there were a number of other ritual activities that were frequently um, added to Dharma assembly itineraries. Um, the uh, fire offering or jinsek in Tibetan or huigong in, in Chinese was uh, one very popular one, almost uh, a part of every uh, single Dharma assembly itinerary. That's another picture from the fire offering. Another very, um, uh, common um, and uh, much beloved item on uh, the Dharma assembly itinerary was life liberation. So here we see um, uh, the lamas at the monastery alongside their Chinese followers uh, liberating yaks. Um, now, uh, life liberation, um, given its, its you know, deep uh, roots and great popularity in both Chinese and Tibetan uh, uh, traditions has really proven a, a, um, a meeting point for the two uh, religious cultures in the past decades. And um, the uh, Chinese followers, particularly in Chengdu, frequently liberate yaks from slaughter yards in um, networks of followers at any rate, frequently liberate yaks from slaughter yards in uh, Chengdu and then they are trucked back to Tibetan areas where various households in nomadic areas vow to um, look after them. 
until their natural deaths. But here at this monastery, what you've got a situation is local herders basically, before they sell their animals or even perhaps even before they've contemplated selling their animals, to, um, vowing to set the, an, a, a, a component of their herd aside as life release animals, which means they vow never to sell them or never to kill them and to look after them and to, until their natural deaths. And so what happens is the Chinese um, followers um, um, pay the herders a certain amount for them um, undertaking this meritorious action. Um, and this sort of activity is seen as um, uh, beneficial clearly to the animals uh, and also assisting herders uh, with ethical livelihoods. That is how it is seen. There's another picture of that. Also, sometimes fish life liberation is practiced if there are nearby rivers. Um, so um, in addition to the Buddhist or the Dharmic components of uh, Dharma assemblies, cultural performances were a frequent element as well. In fact, you could say that the Dharma assembly really integrated elements common to Tibetan festivals and summer picnicking practices more generally. So these included the uh, ample use of the verdant grasslands as a performance arena and song and dance performances. Uh, they would um, uh, sometimes uh, school children would be mobilized to prepare song and dance items. Uh, they'd sometimes give speeches welcoming and thanking the guests. Uh, and uh, frequently too, local Tibetans would uh, lead uh, traditional circle dancing and Chinese followers would join in learning the moves on the go. Um, of course, at a place like Larunga, at a large Dharma assembly like that, there was no cultural uh, entertainment component um, included, but at um, smaller um, monasteries, it was uh, quite frequent. So um, Dharma assemblies, in addition to the religious component, also enable Chinese followers to interact with um, the local or members of the local community in, an, in a more informal register. Um, they dwelled rustically on the monastic grounds, they interacted with monastics and lay people, and to varying degrees found themselves drawn into local lifeways. So these are some pictures of local school children at this particular monastery, and here um, a young student performing a song item, and then there is some dancing going on. And the Chinese uh, visitors are getting involved and taking part in that too. So another really important part of, of uh, the contemporary Dharma assembly uh, were giving and philanthropy. Um, most Dharma assembly attendees um, you know, came prepared with an amount of cash to give away as offerings or gifts. Of course, now with um, a digitalized payment, I'm not sure how that uh, uh, um, would work. Um, so the Dharma Assembly would provide multiple contexts for what we describe as offering up to um, uh, monastic uh, recipients or to the three jewels. So for example, offerings to one's Lama, to the monastic community, donations to the monastery and so forth, but also opportunities to um, give compassionate gifts um, down to the needy. Um, so basically the difference between a religious uh, reverent gift to a monastic recipient and, and charity. So um, this might include supporting the community projects, schools, clinics, etc. cetera. Um, but what was very interesting during my field work is that these practices, these pre-existing um, practices of giving were being extended with the rise of charity volunteerism. Um, and there was an increasing move to incorporate face-to-face, face-to-face, um, face um, yes, um, um, philanthropy campaign, uh, campaigns within a more standard Dharma assembly itinerary. So this was reflective of, um, uh, I guess, what... Um, Kleinman describes as a new ethic of social compassion and volunteerism that um, emerged in China in the first decade of the 2000s. So um, 
in several monastic contexts that I visited, um, this meant that there was more of an emphasis on the um, actually, so I think um, perhaps better to put it this way, that, you know, Chinese followers had all well had long been um, funding schools and clinics um, and undertaking volunteering in Tibetan monastic communities, but really with the um, through the as the 2000s went on, particularly um, with their involvement in and the the I guess the the charity fever that spread around the earthquake uh, rescue missions, then um, people became very interesting and in, interested in this idea of sort of a a rescue style face to face kind of um, philanthropy. And so you see in this picture a very large truck that was driven by two followers from Chengdu themselves to the uh, monastery. It uh, contains uh, sacks of rice for the monastic population. And even though you can't see it in this picture, but uh, the Chinese followers were um, here, you see the monks on top of the truck and handing out the sacks, but the Chinese followers were also very much up there themselves. And so this very sort of active, in person, handing things to people yourself, um, this kind of uh, uh, event or component was um, um, seen in, in Dharma assembly itineraries during this time. And there's another picture of that. And there's another school children, another, and again, another um, ceremony or, or event at which charity is, um, you know, uh, gifts or, or supplies are given to school children. So this is basically making it an, an event that um, the whole community sees, the Chinese followers see, the Tibetan local population see. And so it was really making it into, yeah, I guess something of a, of a, of a, of a charity um, spectacle for the, um, for the community. Um, And then um, uh, sightseeing. So in addition to uh, coming to the monastery, uh, um, really holding a, a Dharma assembly um, entailed Tibetan lamas positioning themselves as personalized points of access to Tibetan regions and its religious culture, particularly its sacred landscapes. Um, they thereby uh, uh, made inaccessible or otherwise inaccessible sites of blessing and sanctity known and legible to Chinese audiences. So these included places like sacred mountains and lakes. Um, they would guide the Chinese visitors in the proper ritual veneration of these places. And they would also mobilize their local knowledge, their social networks and monastery connections to bring Chinese followers to um, other places of interest. So if there were other, so we sort of have to bear in mind that this, this, these areas are ones that to date have had very little uh, tourism infrastructure. And so um, by virtue of their local contacts, um, and knowledge of what's going on in the community, then um, Tibetan lamas were able to sort of rather flexibly and spontaneously incorporate other components in the, into the itinerary. So it might mean visiting, also oh, here is uh, visiting a nearby um, holy mountain. Here is uh, visiting one of the um, purported birthplaces of King Gesar, a very, uh, an epic hero in Tibetan culture. Um, here is a, 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 another monastery um, an hour or so away who were holding their an, an annual chum dancing festival and so the um, Chinese visitors were able to go and, and, and see that for a day, and that was um, another event of that nature that was going on. Um, and in, in, in one case. Um, uh, extensive pilgrimage trips could be tacked on to the Dharma assembly experience. So at one event I attended um, after the actual assembly at the monastery was concluded, everybody got back into their motorcade and embarked on a 10 day um, pilgrimage around um, um, uh, Qinghai, around Amdo that uh, culminated at uh, uh, Kokonor or, Qing, or Qinghai Lake. And um, again, this was a trip that very much um, mobilized the um, the uh, reincarnate lamas monastic networks throughout this region and gave uh, Chinese uh, visitors a trip that they otherwise would not have been able to um, arrange themselves. 
And then finally, relationality. So Dharma assemblies are, you know, in, in essential rest, uh, respects, um, a, 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 a form of uh, social religion. They enabled um, horizontal sociality uh, between Chinese followers. One has to remember that in many cases, networking Chinese lamas have followers all over China. And um, uh, in many cases, they don't know each other. So um, Dharma assemblies actually provided some foundation for the forging of community between these geographically dispersed followers who could, you know, uh, get to know each other during downtime and meals and other occasions and activities um, throughout the duration of the Dharma assembly. They also provided uh, the context for um, uh, uh, time, intimate time with one's teacher. And this was uh, really very much valued by, uh, by followers. Um, generally, um, since uh, many Tibetan lamas have been mobile, highly mobile for the past few decades, many followers don't get to see them very often. And so at the Dharma assembly, one uh, got to see one's lama in his home context, um, got to got to um, get to know his 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 family members, mixed with members of his retinue. Um, uh, perhaps got to seek their life advice about issues, request their blessings, perhaps ask for divination. Um, Dharma assemblies at any rate provided uh, many uh, opportunities for this kind of relationality. They also provided followers with opportunities to seek audience with, um, with other uh, monastics and uh, religious figures who dwelled in the monastery. So meeting with them, venerating them, and also taking photos with them was um, a constituent part of the Dharma assembly experience too. So I just like to end with this idea of eating bitterness. So as with uh, Turner's classic account of pilgrimage, going away uh, to a Dharma assembly at a Tibetan monastery um, was characterized by uh, 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 an experience of liminality. Um, not only did it... Um, uh, was this based on um, a cultural sense of cultural disorientation, but also um, multi-sensory experiences of hardship um, or bitterness that were uh, widely experienced. Um, so here, these are two pictures actually from La Ronga. The one on the left is my friend's mum, and she um, had altitude sickness from the very first day and spent her entire time there carrying around an oxygen canister, which was very, very common. And the one on the right is also from another friend of mine who was uh, similarly suffering the effects of um, altitude uh, sickness. So again, the altitude, but not just the altitude, other aspects too. The, the, the fact is the Dharma Assembly is an event in a very low infrastructure context. You're, you're sleeping in, in, in makeshift improvised um, conditions. Um, often the, uh, the, the, the food can be quite um, simple um, and um, um, sometimes um, uh, not, not up to scratch for everybody who is um, attending. And so um, going on a Dharma assembly um, did uh, commonly among followers entail uh, the ability to uh, eat bitterness, as it was said, to shikhu. Um, this didn't mean, though, that um, um, that and, and this was and this was valued. This was so followers who attended they appreciated the rusticity and the simplicity of um, of of uh, you know the uh, Tibetan monastic context and uh, the Tibetan landscape. Uh, at the same time, though, they did not equate physical um, a lack of physical hardship um, with with inauthenticity or artifice. And so there were, um, in fact, this was sort of, there was sort of something of a, um, there were many actually situations where um, because of the difficult situations and leaking roofs and in no, no facilities for washing and inclement weather on several um, Dharma assemblies that I visited, um, many uh, 
participants were uh, wanting to leave by the second day, were not wanting to stay out the entire, um, the entire trip. And so over the years, in um, some contexts, there has been um, an increasing uh, refinement of uh, conditions for hosting Chinese visitors when they do indeed visit these contexts. So um, yeah, I, I, today I, I hope to um, tell you a bit about how Dharma assemblies have been meeting and mediating the needs of uh, Tibetan lamas, their monasteries and Chinese followers throughout this period. And I also wanted to um, introduce you to the form that the Dharma assembly has taken during these past three decades of cross-cultural religious encounter. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.